Hi. We all have weaknesses. Sometimes it's exercise. Sometimes it's eating. Sometimes it's spending money on frivolous things. This is true whether we're rich or poor, fat or slim. The challenge we all face in life is how do we make these trade-offs? How do we trade off the things that we say that we want to do with the things that we actually do? How do we actually, for instance, set a plan and then fulfill that plan? When we think about this in the saving space, it's a very important issue, particularly for the poor. Because there's lots of things that tempt us on, an, on a daily basis. And if we want to be able to accumulate savings so that we can have a nest egg for a rainy day, or if we live in an in a, in a agricultural setting and we want to be able to have a nest egg so that when it's planting season, we have enough money for fertilizer to invest in the farm. How do we manage to get money away from ourselves and safe in a place and committed so that it doesn't get spent so that it could actually then be used at the time of need? And this is a challenge that, we, that the poor face around the world because they don't have the luxury, for instance, of a certificate of deposit or a retirement savings account, which are very natural commitment savings accounts that we have access to in the developed world. So one of the things that we tested in the Philippines as a, as a first start in this, in this effort to kind of understand uh, in, a, in a fairly rigorous way whether giving people a way of tying up their money could actually lead to real changes in behavior, real changes in outcomes for the household. So in the Philippines we gave people an account, we called it a seed account, which did nothing other than lock their money up. Lock their money up until they reached a goal. So they were told, do you have a goal? Or they were asked, do you have a goal? And if their goal was time-based, then they were told, fine, we're going to give you a separate account and you can put money in there until you reach that date. If their goal was an amount of money, I want $150 because that's what I need for cement in order to finish the floor of my house, then they would be given a goal that's an amount and they could not withdraw their money until they reached that amount. So we set this up as a randomized trial. And we found that in the first year, those who were offered this account saved 80% more um, than they would have otherwise, which is determined by understanding the changes that took place in the control group. The most important result, I think, from this is that the women who were, received this account actually ended up at the end of the year with more power in the household. We saw more household durable goods purchased uh, when women got these accounts. And so that was a really striking result for understanding how not just access to financial services, but access to this particular type of financial service can increase power for women in the household. Now, that was a first start, and there's lots of questions that one could ask about how exactly to make these work. And you could easily imagine in different cultures, different, different outside market environments, that there's different answers to the way these products need to be rolled out. The two most important things that I think we need to understand more about, and there is new research that is forging ahead in this area, is how do people become self-aware? How do they become self-aware to recognize that this is this way of thinking about locking money away from one's future self uh, can help you reach goals? And the second big struggle I think we have in for understanding how to design these accounts is deciding how strict to make the commitment. So the basic concept behind any sort of commitment device is about increasing the price of vice. And the question is, how high to increase that price of ice? If the price is too high, people won't engage in the activity at all in the first place. They won't open the account. Or if it's a commitment contract to exercise more, they won't ever sign the contract. So we have to have the, the contract has to be, the, the, the price of ice has to be higher than it would be normally, but not so high that it scares people away from engaging in the activity, in the, in the contract. But the second point is that it can't be so low that it doesn't have any bite. So how do you strike that balance? In, the, in Uganda, we did a study where we gave people savings accounts. Uh, in, it was actually a school setting with children. And there was two different options. One, the money was locked in and committed to be used for educational expenses. And the other, the money was not locked in for educational expenses. It was, it was going to be paid out in cash, but paid out in cash at a time when it's very convenient to then buy educational expenses because there was an education fair going on in the area where they could use the money and buy their workbook and buy their pencils. People didn't even use, to a large extent, the voucher, the, the one that was committed to educational expenses. They used the other one. And we actually see test scores go up for the children as a result of them getting more workbooks and things of this nature. So it was a very striking result showing how a soft commitment in this context worked better than a hard commitment, but also worked better, to be clear, than nothing. Right? It, was, it was a big positive impact, but, but the minute you push the commitment too high, 
then, then you did not, we did not generate that benefit. This is not to say that soft commitment is the answer, but it does suggest that there is this trade-off that we face in designing these types of products, and we have to figure out how to strike that balance right. So, so one of the, the things that's really obvious about this space is, as with any evaluation, as with any product, it's not a one-size-fit-all. We're not going to do one study in one place and then have an answer for the entire world. We've seen some really interesting, what I would describe as pilots, that show the power of this. There's the one in the Philippines, there's another study in Kenya, which was really striking for showing that a commitment device to farmers at harvest season to invest in fertilizer at planting season was hugely successful. There's a commitment savings account in, in Malawi that was tested that found similarly giving people a commitment savings account led also to higher uh, investment in fertilizer. What's striking there is the money actually flowed through the liquid account, which really suggests that there's something about soft commitment, about teaching people about their own self-control and how to, how to overcome their, their cash management problems on their own using a bank account can lead to, lead to positive benefits. We've also tried the weakest thing that we could think of to do in, in, in Ghana, where we, we put no rules on the account. All we did is we give it a label. It's now your health account. So it's still a commitment savings account, but it has the only cost, the only cost to, to deviating is psychological, is internal, is dissatisfaction with your own behavior. And this too led to a 30% increase. So we're trying to figure out how low we can go in terms of weakening what the commitment is in order to give people as much flexibility that they really need, but still guide them in the direction they want. So from there, we're actually going now in the field with a new study that's even lower, and we're just giving people two accounts. Rather than one account, they get two accounts. There's not even a label on it, and we want to see whether this partitioning of money alone can lead people towards achieving their goals and savings, and, and then actually changes in the way they allocate their money and allocate their expenditures in the household. So there's a lot of exciting work, but a lot of it is at the pilot phase where we're still seeing a lot of, a lot of micro tests which are really necessary for understanding the individual decision making process and the household decision making process, how these things interact with different dynamics when, there's, when women and men have different levels of power within the household. Whenever we're thinking about public policy, we always have to ask, or we should always ask, What's the market failure? Why are we talking about this in the first place? Why aren't we just letting markets work and firms offer things and people buy them and everyone's happy? So what are the market failures here? There's two. One could be a behavioral failure, which is really another way of saying there's a principal agent problem between me and my future self, or the person I want to be and the person I am. And so I, I need things that help me be the person I want to be. So if it's about temptation, what it means is I'm trying to squirrel money away from my future self because I don't trust my future self. I'd like to be able to write a contract with my future self and commit that future self to doing better things for me. And so a commitment device is just that. It's a way of solving that internal principal agent problem. The other set of market failures come from the household. Maybe I'm squirreling money away to keep it from my husband. Well, that's another way of saying I have a principal agent problem within the household. I want, to, I want to commit to certain things. I'd like the household to engage in certain behavior. I don't have total control over the resources, nor my, nor my husband. And if I let the, let the money stay in the household, then I, I lose control over it. And so both of these are market failures effectively, one within myself, one within the household. And in both settings, a commitment savings device is a vehicle for helping me solve that problem and attain the goal that I have in life for, in terms of how I'm going to use financial services to save up money for a, for a rainy day, to save up money for investments, for my children, whatever the case may be. And hopefully through a sequence of these pilots, we're really starting to get clarity on what macro level policies can be for large banks and large financial institutions so that they can roll out products that are both profitable for the banks and at the same time really helping people achieve their goals in life and use financial services to help achieve those goals. Thank you.